Hi, my name is Jake Snell. I'm currently a postdoc at Princeton University working with Professor Tom Griffiths. Uh, it's uh, really an honor for me to be speaking here at L3D IBW workshop. Um, I'd like to thank all the organizers for putting together this workshop and for inviting me to speak. Uh, so today I'll be talking about Bayesian few shot classification with one versus each polygamma augmented Gaussian processes. This talk is based on joint work with Professor Richard Zemmel that we presented at ICLR last year um, with some additional perspective um, added in that we've sort of gained since then. So uh, first I'd like to motivate the setting a little bit. Um, deep learning is a powerful class of machine learning algorithms that learn representations from scratch on raw input data. They're useful for a wide range of applications, including image classification, speech recognition, natural language processing, and many, many others. Uh, deep learning has made tremendous short strides in recent years in terms of predictive accuracy. And one of the key factors to their success is the use of large amounts of training data. For example, here are some tasks and corresponding data sets that have been used for training deep neural networks. One unifying theme is uh, their vast scale with sizes often in the millions or billions that allow the, the neural networks to learn rich representations. Uh, another aspect of the standard supervised deep learning sort of paradigm is that the space of outputs is fixed and known ahead of time. So for example, uh, if we want to train an image classifier on ImageNet, we know that there are a thousand classes and that doesn't change even at test time. However, we would like our machine learning systems to quickly adapt to new circumstances where data is not so plentiful. For example, imagine a content recommendation system where we want to recommend movies or books that a user may be interested in. We'd like to make good recommendations to a new user joining the system even if they have very little history. This is known as the cold start problem. Or we may want to classify documents into different topics based on the contents of the document. So over the course of time, the meaning of words can shift based on their usage. So we, we may want to be able to adapt the topics to handle the new usage of these words, but we have very few instances of these words yet used in their new context. Or we may have a pre-trained medical diagnosis system that um, predicts what disease somebody has based on a medical image. Um, there may be new or rare diseases that we want to recognize, but we have very little data collected for them. So a natural question arises, which is, how can we broaden the standard supervised learning paradigm, which has large data set sizes and a fixed number of output classes, to be able to handle these sorts of situations where data is scarce and new classes may arise over time? So one alternate paradigm for studying the, these um, questions is known as few shot classification, which I'll sometimes call FSC for short. So in few shot classification at training time, a learner has access to a, a large label data set with an ample amount of data for each class. But at test time, the learner is presented with what are called few shot episodes. So in a few shot episode, there is a small label data set called a support set consisting of just a few examples of each of um, a few novel classes. Then it must classify new examples, also called query examples, across these classes. So this procedure may be repeated many times and the performance is then averaged over these few shot ep episodes. So an episode with k classes and n examples per class, we would call that a k-way n-shot um, episode. In the example shown here, the, cl the classes at training time are letters from the English alphabet, and at test time, the learner is presented with a five-way, five-shot episode of Korean letters. Uh, and then it must classify this new query example as belonging to one of these five classes. So few shot classification is a challenging task for machine learning systems. Um, but the good news is that there is at least some hope because humans are successful few shot learners. So hopefully uh, over time, the research community can, can borrow, uh, you know, maybe some tricks from, from humans in order to solve this challenging task. So two of the most popular approaches uh, to few shot classification are gradient based meta learning and metric learning based approaches. So gradient-based meta-learning approaches such as MAML, they seek to learn an initialization of a neural network that can easily be adapted to a few-shot episode 
with just one or maybe a few steps of gradient descent. On the other hand, metric learning approaches uh, seek to learn an embedding space where a few shot classification can easily be performed with a simple model like k nearest neighbors or nearest centroid algorithms. So I'll be focusing on metric learning approaches in this talk as they are more closely related to Gaussian processes as we will see a little bit later. So one of the original metric learning based approaches is known as Siamese networks introduced by Bromley et al. in uh, 1993. The key feature here is that there's a shared neural network that extracts representations from each of a, uh, a pair of images. Um, more specifically, given two images, xi and xj, the probability that um, xi and xj belong to the same class is determined by a shared embedding function f theta, where this f theta would be some deep uh, neural network. So the probability that yi, or the class um, identity for example i, and yj, which is the class for um, example j, given those input images, is equal to the sigmoid of the negative distance between those two as computed with respect to this uh, embedding space. And so the, the intuition here is that if two examples are very far apart in this latent representation space, then they are less likely to belong to the same class. And uh, conversely, if they are very close, then they're more likely to belong to the same class. So this uh, objective is, this network rather, is trained by uh, minimizing binary cross entropy for randomly selected pairs of same or different images. So af after that, uh, matching networks were introduced. Um, so here the notation is a little bit different. So given a support set S consisting of n examples, um, with which are input-output pairs x1, y1, x2, y2, all the way up through xn, yn. Um, so given that support set in a query image x star, attention is computed over the support um, according to this expression. So what this is doing is this is a softmax over the support examples. And um, the input to the softmax is the negative distance between the query example and each of those support examples as computed by this um, embedding space uh, parameterized by theta. And the idea is that if a query example is um, particularly close to some of the support examples in the latent space, then um, those support examples are going to um, have a large uh, attention value corresponding to them. And so we can create a predictive distribution, and the way Matching Networks does this is it uses some weighted indicator functions. So if um, we are interested in predicting the probability that y star is equal to c, where c is some class, what we do is we find all the examples in our support set that belong to class c, and we just add up their corresponding attention weights. And that's the probabil predicted probability uh, predicted by matching networks. And so, um, essentially, it, it's a, a form of uh, attention over the entire support set where each example can contribute to the output prediction. So later, um, after matching networks, uh, prototypical networks were introduced. And so in prototypical networks, in, instead of uh, having a form of attention um, over the examples themselves, First, each class is summarized by a prototypical representation. And what that is, is it's essentially the mean of the representations of all the examples belonging to that class. So in this case, um, we have five examples for class one. We would take their mean, and that would give us the class prototype uh, for that class. And so the prototypes are these black dots here. And then once we, if we want to make a prediction for a query example, we would project it into this uh, embedding space, compute the distances to each of the, the prototypes, and then we would take a softmax of the negative distances. And the idea is that um, if a query example is close to a particular class's prototype, then it's more likely to belong to that class. 
So in this case, um, this query example would be classified as class two because that's the closest prototype. So now, um, now that I've sort of introduced these um, sort of uh, background metric learning approaches, I wanted to discuss two issues with applying these sorts of algorithms to few shot classification. And the first is what I'll call a sort of need for model selection. So what I mean by this is that um, we typically think of few shot classification just in terms of a certain number um, of examples per class. So we may focus on, you know, let's say five shot. Um, but I, I think as we um, sort of look towards applying these sorts of algorithms to real world situations, um, it's very rarely the case that we actually have exactly five examples per class. And so I think when we're designing few shot learning algorithms, I think it's important to think about how they can scale up as um, more and more examples arrive for each class. And so here's a figure from Trantafilo et al. Um, essentially what it's showing is uh, classification uh, prediction accuracy as a function of the shot. So what this means is that on the right hand side we have a hundred examples per class and on the left hand side we have maybe one or just a few examples per class. And here the uh, matching networks is this green line here and prototypical networks is this red line here. And what we see is that prototypical networks captures a simpler inductive bias and that ends up translating to, to better performance than matching networks for a um, very small number of examples per class. But at the same time, as more and more examples arrive, uh, arrive for those particular classes, the performance of prototypical networks tends to flatten out. Um, but on the other hand, matching networks, as more and more examples arrive, uh, the performance continues to increase. And so, uh, one question is how can we sort of gracefully scale from simpler models that work well in the uh, very low shot setting to more complex models that um, can better capture more and more data as they are observed. So that's the first issue. The second issue I wanted to talk about is the importance of uncertainty for few shot classification. So. Um, we know that um, if there's not many labeled examples for a particular class, then there's a significant amount of model uncertainty in the sense that there may be um, multiple models that are all consistent with the observed data. And if we had observed many, many examples for um, these various classes, then maybe we could really sort of pin down what the best model is that explains those um, those observed data. But in the few shot case, we often don't have that luxury, which means that there's uncertainty around which, which model is, is going to be the best one. At the same time, few shot classifiers are increasingly being used for user facing applications where it's very important to know when the model is uncertain. So here I'm showing a dermatological disease diagnosis application where we may want to make predictions for rare classes that don't have very much labeled data. And on the right hand side, I'm showing a facial recognition uh, for assistive technology application where a user uh, may want to control a computer based on their facial gestures. And in both of these cases, capturing uncertainty is very important because let's say a, a classifier confidently predicted the wrong class for the disease diagnosis. Well, based on that information, uh, a doctor may recommend some treatment that's not appropriate for the patient. And at the same time, in terms of the facial recognition application, um, if, if the system tries to adapt to a new user with very little data, but um, confidently predicts the wrong action or the wrong gesture, then the user may become very frustrated with the system and just give up altogether. So in both of these cases, we, what we would really like to be able to do is marginalize over models that are consistent with the observed data and use that to help to better capture predictive uncertainty.
and so um, both of these concerns, both the model selection and the uncertainty issue, um, I think can be naturally addressed with Bayesian models. So um, in Bayesian models, we first specify a prior over models, indicated here by this P of H. And then we use Bayes' rule to compute the posterior given some data. So we do that by using Bayes' rule, which says that the posterior distribution over models is proportional to the prior times the likelihood. And if we expand the likelihood, that consists of the product of um, n terms, one for each example in the data set D. And what this means is that um, the, since the prior has just one term here, we may, um, our prior may bias us towards simpler models. But as more and more observations arrive, the, um, that prior may be sort of overridden by the likelihood term because the likelihood term will play a larger and larger role as this n increases. Now, of course, if the, if the, the data end up coming from a very complicated distribution, then this uh, prior may be overridden fairly, fairly quickly, or if they are, in fact, consistent with the, the, a, a simpler model, then you know, the, the Bayesian posterior should reflect that. So that's, um, that's how Bayesian models can sort of address that first concern, which is gracefully scaling from simpler to more complex models um, in the face of uh, additional data that may arrive. And in terms of the second concern, which is capturing uncertainty, if we look at the way predictions are made in Bayesian models, um, we would probably use the posterior predictive distribution which I'm showing here. It's this P of Y star given X star um, and the observed data D. And what that is, is the integral over um, the likelihood times the posterior. And what that's essentially doing is it's saying we have this collection of models um, and we're going to look at the posterior and essentially weight the predictions of each model by its posterior probability. So th what that means is if we have some models that are very um, good explanations of our observed data, they will have large posterior probability and we're going to weight those more heavily in terms of making our predictions. And in particular, if there are multiple models that fairly equally well explain our observed data, then when we make a prediction, if we do it in this way, we'll actually be uh, averaging over each of those uh, different models. And that naturally captures this uh, uncertainty that we would like to, to capture, especially in user-facing applications. So to get a little bit more specific, um, we typically have um, some model parameters W, and we have some hyperparameters indicated here by theta. So our prior distribution over the model parameters would be this P theta of W. And then after observing our data D, the posterior over the parameters is computed according to this expression. Um, so here we have the prior, we have the likelihood, and we have the evidence or the marginal likelihood in the denominator here. So the marginal likelihood is essentially um, how well does this entire class of models um, explain the observed data. And we get that by integrating the likelihood times the prior. And um, once we compute the posterior distribution, we can also compute the posterior predictive distribution, which similar to the previous slide is um, the integral of the likelihood times the, the posterior. And this as I mentioned before, that's what allows us to make predictions while ma marginalizing over the model parameters. And so one thing we might want to do is try to learn what these appropriate hyperparameters theta are. So um, we may want to actually try to maximize this marginal likelihood and find the hyperparameters theta that really maximize um, the probability of our observed data. And that's what empirical Bayes does, and that's the approach that we take in our work here.
So now I wanted to talk about Gaussian processes, which are a very interesting um, class of Bayesian models that I think um, may be particularly relevant for few shot classification. So what is a Gaussian process? Uh, well, a Gaussian process or a GP defines a distribution over functions such that the output of the function evaluated at a finite set of points is jointly Gaussian. And it's specified by a mean function, m of x, and a covariance function, also known as a kernel, uh, k of x and x prime. So let's say um, we would, uh, we're, in, we're interested in the function value at uh, three input points. Let's call them x1, x2, and x3. Well, if we were interested in what the GP prior is evaluated at these points, what we would do is we would plug x1, x2, and x3 into our mean function, and that would give us the prior means. And then we would need a three by three covariance matrix. Um, and the way we do that is we plug in all pairs of inputs into the covariance function. So we would get our three by three covariance matrix by evaluating k of x1, x1, k of x1, x2, k of x1, x3, and so on and so forth. And so conditioned on some finite set of input points, the GP gives us this recipe for getting a Gaussian prior. And um, so one nice thing about uh, GPs is uh, if we end up using a Gaussian likelihood, as we would often do for, let's say, regression, closed form expressions exist for both the marginal likelihood and the posterior distribution. And that's because a Gaussian is conjugate with itself. So if we have a Gaussian prior and a Gaussian likelihood, then um, you can multiply those together and you get another Gaussian out. So um, the covariance function plays a pretty important role in GPs. and. Um, the, the properties of the functions that we get out are determined primarily by this covariance function. So here I'm showing some different choices of kernels we could use. If we use a squared exponential kernel here, we get these fairly smooth looking functions out. Or if we were to use a periodic kernel um, that has these sort of long range dependencies determined by um, the, the, the form of the periodic kernel here, we can get these functions with um, some periodic structure to them. So choosing the proper covariance function that matches our data is pretty important. Um, at the same time, we would like really like to leverage the power of deep neural networks to learn a good kernel. And um, so in our work, we, we borrow the approach of uh, deep kernel learning by Wilson et al. that applies kernels on top of the learned representation space. So an example of how we might do that is on the left hand side here I'm showing a squared exponential kernel and well, instead of computing the, the kernel directly on the input space we would instead project both x and x prime first to some shared embedding space and then apply the kernel there. And that, what that allows us to do is have these pow powerful and expressive kernels, but still also maintain some of these uh, qualitative properties that we might want to, to maintain. So what are some benefits of GPs for few-shot learning? Well, compared to um, other Bayesian approaches, such as Bayesian deep learning, where we put a prior directly on the weights of a neural network, Computation of marginal likelihood and posterior predictive distribution is relatively straightforward. Um, in fact, as I mentioned before, it's closed form for Gaussian likelihood. Um, so one of the traditional uh, drawbacks of GPs is that they have poor scaling with a number of examples. Um, they scale cubically with the, the number of examples in your um, training set. But that is less relevant for few shot episodes because by definition, they're few shot. So we don't have many examples in our support set, which is what we're conditioning on in the few shot case. So um, and it, another advantage of GPs is that the deep covariance functions that we might learn, they're powerful because they, they're applied on top of a uh, learned deep neural network, but at the same time they're interpretable in the sense that we can input two 
examples x1 and x2, and then the deep covariance function will tell us how similar or how different um, it thinks that they are. Another nice aspect of GPs is that they can be situated uh, pretty nicely with respect to previous metric learning approaches. So with respect to Siamese networks, rather than using some distance function to directly predict the probability of two examples being same or different, we have our covariance function that's specifying a priori how similar x is to x prime. And with respect to matching networks, rather than using the attention to weight the contribution of the support examples directly, our covariance function just specifies the prior covariance, and then Bayesian inference tells us how we can get predictions that uh, incorporates both this prior covariance while also being consistent with the observed data. And finally, with respect to prototypical networks, instead of specifying a simple model class directly, uh, GPs can learn the appropriate prior that facilitates few shot adaptation. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we actually would apply GPs to do classification. Um, for a standard classification task, we would have a softmax, let's say, over C different classes. Um, in order to do that, if we had n data points, what we would want to do is we would want to compute the logits of um, across the these C classes for each of these n data points. And so we could represent that by, say, an n by C matrix. Or we could flatten that out and treat it as one flat vector with uh, n times C number of elements. And that's what this F is doing here. It's essentially um, taking all the logits for the first class, for examples 1 through n, then all the logits for the second class, um, for examples 1 through n, and so on and so forth, all the way up through class C. And what we're going to do is we're going to put a GP prior directly on this F vector. And the way we're going to do that is we have a zero mean function, um, because a priori we don't expect any one of these classes to be more or less likely than the other. And then we have to specify a, a covariance function. And uh, what's typically done in GP classification is we make the covariance function block diagonal in the sense that um, all the uh, logits for class one covary with each other, but not with any other classes logits, and so on and so forth. So one drawback of course, is that if we were to use the softmax likelihood, that renders inference intractable because the softmax likelihood is not conjugate with a Gaussian prior. So there are various approaches to, to deal with inference in this case, such as Laplace approximation, expectation propagation, variational inference, multinomial probit regression, or we could just um, treat um, the observations just as if they were from a Gaussian likelihood and to predefine the ground truth logits as either plus one or minus one. So the approach we take here is um, we use something called polygamma augmentation, um, which I'll explain here in, in terms of just binary classification. So the way this works is that we take the logistic likelihood, which is a product of um, individual logistic likelihoods for each data point, you can rewrite that as um, this, where we have uh, a sigmoid to the yi times 1 minus the sigmoid to the 1 minus yi. And you can rewrite it a bit to get this expression on the right-hand side. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a technique called data augmentation, somewhat confusingly, because here it doesn't refer to um, you know, augmentations of an image like transformations or rotations or crops or anything like that. Instead, it means we're going to have a new random variable, in this case, omega. And what we're going to do is we're going to define this omega such that if we were to integrate it out, we would recover the original likelihood. Now, this seems a little bit counterintuitive because we had a difficult likelihood. And now we're going to introduce some new random variable. Um, wouldn't that make things even more complicated? Uh, the trick is that if we choose this omega in the right way, this p of y given f and omega becomes a lot easier to deal with. 
So conditioned on omega, we get some nice p y of f given, uh, sorry, p of y given f and omega, and we're, we're going to be able to handle that much better than the original likelihood. So um, I won't delve deep into the details, but I'll just say if you, it turns out if you define omega according to a, a standard polygamma distribution, there's an in integral identity that we can use, which ends up meaning that if we condition on this o omega i, we get something that's proportional to a Gaussian. Um, and so what that means is that even though this p of y given f is not conjugate with a Gaussian prior, if we define this omega to be coming from a polygamma prior, conditioned on that omega, then we do get something in Gaussian. And the nice aspect of that is what we can do is we can set up a Gibbs sampling procedure where we sample from omega and then sample the f values and then back to omega. And uh, we can do that sampling fairly efficiently and conditioned on those omega values, we have a Gaussian, which means that we can apply these nice um, closed form expressions for marginal likelihood and the uh, predictive distribution. So one thing that we would like to be able to do is extend it not just to binary classification, but also to be able to handle multiple classes. The issue is that the that polygamma integral identity doesn't directly apply um, to the softmax likelihood. So there have been some approaches proposed in the past. One is um, to use a stick breaking construction where we decompose a multi-way classification into a sequence of uh, one versus rest classification problems. But unfortunately, we found that that introduces some undes undesirable asymmetry across the classes. Um, and uh, especially in the fuchsia case, where we don't have that much data to uh, sort of override a, a prior like that, we, we found that that was not, um, not uh, the best strategy for a few shot classification. And in terms of, um, there's another approach called the logistic softmax, which is similar to the ordinary softmax, except it replaces the exponential with a sigmoid. And we found that this approach, it's difficult for it to capture confident predictions because there's a sort of saturation effect. If a particular class's um, logit, this FC here, if that's very large, then the maximum that this sigmoid can attain is one. And that's unlike the ordinary softmax where exp of FC could be very, very large and, and sort of you can get a nice confident prediction. So those are two um, previous approaches. So we decided to do something a little bit different. Um, we, uh, our approach, is, we, we call it the one versus each likelihood. It's based on the one versus each softmax approximation introduced by Titsius in 2016. Um, in, in that case, it was originally proposed as a lower bound than the softmax to handle a sort of extreme classification with a large number of classes. The way it works is that it rewrites the softmax likelihood as a sum of differences between the ground truth logit and each other logit. And then it uses this um, inequality here to rewrite it as a product of sigmoids. So um, it, uh, originally it was used as a lower bound on the softmax um, but we propose to use it as a likelihood in its own right, sort of as an approximation to the softmax directly. And um, the nice thing about this form is that since it's the product of many sigmoids, we can directly apply the standard binary polygamma augmentation to this difference Fc minus Fc prime. So it turns out that this is actually what's known as a composite likelihood that uh, results from considering all pairs of of classes. So how does how does this look like? So here I'm visualizing the likelihoods um, for um, softmax, Gaussian, logistic softmax, and the one versus each likelihood. And in this case, I'm considering three classes where F3 is always clamped to zero. 
So the x-axis is going to be f1 and the y-axis is f2. And intuitively what we would expect is that f1 is large but f2 is small, then we would get a confident prediction for class 1 and vice versa. And so here's the, the probability contours for the softmax. Um, and in terms of the Gaussian, the way the Gaussian likelihood works is it assumes that the ground truth logits would be f1 is equal to 1 and f2 is equal to minus 1. So anything sort of uh, that's not close to that uh, sort of has less probability assigned to it. And as I had mentioned before, the logistic softmax um, has this issue where it's similar to the softmax, but it's quite a bit more flattened um, in the sense that it doesn't, it, it's less able to have competent predictions. Notice that the scale here only goes up to 0.64 as opposed to the softmax, which goes up uh, close to one. Um, similarly to the softmax, R1 versus each is pretty close. Um, I would say the main difference is here where F1 and F2 are fairly similar. It's a bit flatter, but it, it still is able to capture these confident predictions that we would like. And, and overall, I think its shape is quite similar to the softmax. Okay, so one thing we could do is apply it to a simple data set. So here we're applying Gaussian process classification to a two-dimensional version of iris classification. And we can see, basically, get a qualitative sense for these. Um, so the Gaussian likelihood has some artifacts um, here. You can see where um, it's predicting fairly well close to where the data is, but it has... Um, these classes can kind of jump over each other, um, which I think is uh, less than desirable. Uh, logistic softmax, the decision boundary itself is fairly fairly nice, um, but as I mentioned before, it, it's uh, less confident in regions where there is a, a lot of data. One versus each is similar to the softmax, but perhaps a little bit more overconfident in, in some cases, but um, it, it is fairly close to the softmax. So how do we actually do hyperparameter learning? Well, we consider two objectives. One is the log marginal likelihood. What, what the log marginal likelihood does is it takes the support set and the query set and pools them together and then looks at the log marginal likelihood of that sort of data as a whole. And then we also consider the log predictive likelihood, which is very analogous to standard you know, a few shot um, training procedures where you condition on the support set and then you try to optimize the, the log predictive likelihood um, for the, the query set. In both cases, we do some GIP sampling to get some posterior, uh, approximate posterior samples for the uh, omega, which are, remember are, are the, um, the augmented random variables that come from the poly gamma distribution. And um, we use uh, we can use Fisher's identity to approximate the gradient, as shown here. And we found interestingly that rather than running one chain for a long time, we found it better to run many chains in parallel that were very short. So we we found that we could get good uh, signal with even just one step of, of Gibbs for training. So in terms of classification accuracy, we have uh, some results here for different methods, including some metric learning, some fine tuning, and um, some gradient-based meta-learning approaches. Um, and we found that our method here, both in terms of the marginal likelihood and predictive likelihood, is, is um, fairly close to the, the top. Um, and, uh, you know, if we just choose one of these, if we were just to choose marginal likelihood, we found that Marginal likelihood does better for one shot, um, and predictive likelihood tends to do better for five shot. In terms of calibration, uh, we also measured the calibration error for these different methods, and we found that um, fine-tuning approaches and approaches that use a non-softmax likelihood, like uh, deep kernel transfer, which uses a Gaussian likelihood, and a logistic softmax-based uh, Gaussian process, they don't 
uh, they're not very well calibrated. Whereas prototypical networks in Bayesian mammal, which both use softmax likelihoods, they are fairly well calibrated, as is the one versus each uh, based guessing process that we proposed. So we also have some experiments on robustness to input noise and out of distribution detection, where we found that our method does fairly well in both of those cases. It's not a clear winner, but it, it is among the top performing methods in, in each of these uh, different scenarios. So to wrap up, um, we uh, talked about how Bayesian methods are interesting for few shot classification because they naturally handle this transition from few shot to many shot, and they naturally capture model uncertainty. In particular, GPs are pretty appealing due to their nice theoretical properties. Uh, we proposed our novel GP classification method that combines polygamma augmentation and the one versus each likelihood for tractable inference, and we showed strong accuracy and uncertainty quantification on uh, benchmarks, including calibration, robustness to noise, and out of episode detection. In terms of future work, um, we may want to consider, instead of using empirical Bayes, uh, a full Bayesian treatment of the hyperparameters may enable better adaptation. We may want to incorporate class-specific covariances into our covariance function because different features may be more relevant uh, for distinguishing different classes. Or we uh, may want to extend to generalized future classification where we have to classify over both base and alpha classes. So to conclude, I'd like to thank uh, Richard Zemmel, my uh, PhD advisor at the time with whom I collaborated on this project. Um, and the paper and PyTorch code that this talk are, are based on, they are both available at my website shown here. I'll flash up these uh, references so anybody who's interested can uh, pause the video and take a look at those. And um, that's all I had. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you.